Today, I'm going to be talking to another great guest、uh, from the US who is working here now as a part time teacher. And the person I'm talking about is Mr. Nima Majidi. I met you and talked to you. I knew you had amiable and approachable personality. And I know for a fact today's show is going to be great. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. In Bukhara, I teach at the Pedagogical Institute <clears throat> where I teach linguistics, history,、um, English. Um, and cross cultural communication. So it's a lot of fun. It's kind of a balancing act between thinking too big and thinking too small. But、um, that's definitely kind of one of the drawbacks is kind of that balancing act between,、mm-hmm. you know, those lenses. I, I'm actually a little ashamed to say this, but I feel like you know more about the city than I do about my hometown. This is mind blowing. Definitely. English is definitely not an easy language. I think it's one of those languages that you really have to interact with authentic materials. The best things that you can learn from are English, are not just, you know, are English language materials,、um, English news articles, English blog posts, Instagram posts, Facebook posts, songs even. Our podcasts like this one. <laughs> Our podcast exactly like this one. We have been speaking great English here, perfect English. What's your next move here once when you get a negative confirmation from a student? Say that they don't really understand it, fully grasp it. Do you simply repeat the same concept or try explaining it in different words? And she said, when you use Google Translate, you're not cheating me, right? You're not pulling wool, the wool over my eyes. I already I can tell, right? It's really easy to tell. But you're cheating yourself, right? You're denying yourself the opportunity to learn. I know you have some experience in teaching SAT and ACT.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, what do you say we talk about that a little as well? And、sure. hope you don't feel like I'm taking you on a roller coaster of different topics here. How a lot of countries are now looking at what's happening in Palestine, for example,、um, and kind of the US role and the US complicity in that genocide. And they are kind of then a little bit more, the next time the US comes and starts talking about democracy and human rights, they're a little bit more skeptical. I'm sort of surprised here that you didn't mention Joe Rogan. Because <laughs> none of the guests I had on the podcast from the US mentioned Joe Rogan on their list. He,、uh-uh. he didn't even make it to the list. And oddly enough, he's one of the number one top podcasters in the world, the, the best podcaster in the world.、Yeah. So、what's one UFC match you'd be willing to pay a million dollars to watch? At the same time, I feel like UFC has a new competition. They are not the only game in town anymore. And I'm talking about here influencer boxers like Jake Paul. Right? How do you feel about the upcoming match between Jake Paul and Mike Tyson? Faith. Have faith that things will work themselves out. Hey, folks. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of a d u s t r a m u s e I'm your host here again, Muhammad Ali. And today I'm going to be talking to another great guest、uh, from the US who is working here now as a part time teacher. And the person I'm talking about is Mr. Nima Majidi. Mr. Nima Majidi, welcome for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And I'd like to start off this episode with our meetup story. Like, so before we. I, we exchanged a few messages and we t- talked over the phone, and then we decided to go out to get some food and we had a long conversation. And, and I, I can say that itself was a long podcast. We should have brought a camera or something <laughs> and recorded the whole、uh, thing. Yeah. And, and I, I, could, I, could, I could tell from the moment I met you and talked to you, I knew you had amiable and approachable personality. And I know for a fact today's show is going to be great. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So, would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? Yeah. yeah. So,、um, like you said, my name is Nima Majidi.、Uh-huh. I am a Fulbright English teaching assistant here in Bukhara.、Um, I have been here since early September 2023,、um, and I'm going to be here for a few more months. I am originally from the United States.、Mm-hmm. I was born and raised there.、Um, but, you know, as many are quick to guess, Uh, uh, ethnically, my family's from Iran. My parents were born in Iran、um, and raised there, and、mm-hmm. they came to the United States、um, in the mid 80s.、Mm-hmm. So I definitely I grew up with a lot of Persian culture around me.
um, speaking Persian language at home. And that was one of the big motivators um, for me deciding to come to Bukhara because the Persian language, because Persian and Tajik are so similar. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. a little bit about me. In Bukhara, I teach at the Pedagogical Institute <clears throat> where I teach linguistics, history, um, English, um, and cross-cultural communication. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, I see. So I'd like to know a little more about the program you're participating. So it's called Teacher Exchange Program, right? Yeah. So my program is through the United States Department of State. It's called the Fulbright Program, uh, F-U-L Bright, um, B-R-I-G-H-T. Um, and essentially it works in multiple ways. So for U.S. citizens, it allows us to apply to different programs to study, work, and teach abroad. Um, and for foreign students, it allows them to come to the United States to pursue graduate education. Uh, so I, uh, being a U.S. citizen, apply to Uzbekistan to teach through, um, <coughs> excuse me, as an English teaching assistant. So that is my official title here. I'm an English teaching assistant or ETA. Mm -hmm. um, and basically that means, it, you know, as the name suggests, I work with the university to teach alongside other professors um, but help develop develop assignments, develop curriculum, um, and host speaking clubs. So in addition to speak, teaching um, inside the classroom, I also host speaking clubs. Oh, sounds very interesting. So what made you sign up for this pro program? Like, why did you get into this program? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I knew for, um, that I wanted to apply to the program for a bit. Uh, so I was thinking about where I wanted to apply and kind of what kind of countries I was considering, what factors were important for me. I first learned about Uzbekistan, um, you know, learned about it in like an academic sense. Um, my junior year of high school, when one of the articles that we had to read for our final exam was about Uzbekistan um, and labor rights here. And so that was kind of my first foray into Uzbekistan academically. I thought it was really interesting. And so when a few months later, it came time for me to decide what country I wanted to apply to. After doing extensive research, I applied to Uzbekistan um, and hoped, A, that I would get accepted and B, that if I did get accepted, I would get placed in Bukhara. So from even from before I came, I knew that I wanted to be in Bukhara specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I got incredibly lucky in that sense. Um, as far as the reasons for me coming here, I wanted to go to a place that was as far as Americans are concerned, a little bit off the beaten path. So somewhere where I had not had the opportunity to explore, to interact with a culture that had lots of history, lots of traditions, lots of great food and lots of art. And that's something that Uzbekistan has been, you know, 100%. Uh, so every single day I grow more and more happy with my decision to be here. And I could not, could not recommend it for any Americans who might be considering the program or for anybody listening to the podcast. I could not recommend coming to Uzbekistan, visiting Bukhara, um, more off, or more highly, you know, it's been an amazing experience and yeah, I'm very fortunate to be here today. Yeah. That, that was one of the best recommendations ever Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, that you gave us such a glowing recommendation for people watching and wanting to come here. Yeah. And uh, what do you, what do you say? We talk a little about your university major as well. Mm -hmm. So I remember you telling us that you study international relations, right? Right. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so I was going to ask you your reason for picking up this major. So why did you decide to do a major in international relations? Yeah, so that's also a long answer. Mm -hmm. um, but so but when I was applying to schools, for most schools, I knew that I wanted to eventually go down a legal path. Um, and I applied to a lot of political science, some like language programs, some political science programs. Um, but the university that I applied to and that I ended up studying at in the United States called Georgetown University, they have, you know, exceptional school of foreign service. So I decided that when I was applying to Georgetown, I would apply into the school of foreign service because I wanted to, you know, study international relations. And kind of the reasoning behind that is number one, you know, I always, I loved humanities growing up kind of from a young age. I knew that was more geared towards humanities than I was maybe science or math. But also I wanted to, you know, work in a field that I felt like I would eventually have the opportunity to help people. And so I kind of international relations seemed like an opportunity to do that on a broad scale, to learn about world history, which I loved, but also world cultures, to interact with people whose minds and experiences and lives are completely different than mine. And that was an opportunity that international relations offered and an opportunity that Georgetown offered. Um, and so I ended up, when I went to Georgetown, 
I was in the School of Foreign Service. I ended up doing like a dual degree, so like a combined degree between our business school and our School of Foreign Service. So the degree was called Business and Global Affairs. And then I minored in International Development and Persian Studies, just so I could round out that sort of international like humanities classes, language classes, literature classes, and culture classes. So um, once again, I loved, loved where I went to school. I love Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I'm incredibly happy I chose to study international relations. It you know, allowed me to expand really my horizons, broaden my scope, and learn about the world in a completely different, through a completely different lens. Yeah, let me take a step back and follow up on one of the points you made here. So you made the point that at some point, in your past, you realized that you want to get into international relations. Right. So uh, what made you come to that realization? Or was it was it like one turning point in your life or an accumulation of several different uh, unrelated events? That's a good question. It's a good question. I like to say there's it was accumulation of several unrelated events. So it wasn't necessarily like a single thing, a single event that made, us, made me want to study international relations. I knew from even, even when I was in high school and I was applying to universities and we had to list our majors, for most schools, international relations seemed like a pipe dream um, or it seemed like something that was unrealistic. But um, one of the main things that led me to my current university was the opportunity to study international relations. So going back, a couple of things that influenced that decision were, number one, like I said, a desire to work in a field that has you know, some benefit for the broader population. Um, that remains to be seen right now, whether or not how every study that studies international relations does that or if that will really be the case, but at least the potential to do so. So that was number one. Um, like I said, studying, kind of getting involved in debate and model United Nations, like extracurricular activities from a young age. Um, so in middle school and through high school, doing debate in model United Nations, kind of learning more about international law, international policy, international issues. Um, and honestly, I think really the main driving factor is I, I come from a household that in which the TV was always on, the news was always on. Uh, my dad is not a big, you know, Turkish drama watcher, but he loves his news. And so the news was on when I went to school, when I was eating my, you know, cereal to go to school in the morning and it was on in the afternoon and in the evenings. And so I don't know if you guys have ever watched American news, but there's not a lot of good news on there. Um, and so kind of learning about these problems, learning about things that exist and kind of thinking about trying to think about, okay, we all know the problems. We see them every night, every morning. How can we fix them? Or how can I gain the tools and the education to fix them? So kind of those were the factors that led me to study international relations, a combination of those. I was actually going to ask you if there was any family influence, but you kind of already answered that question. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things where my family would have loved it if I didn't study international mm -hmm. relations. My mom studied medicine um, or she studied that she works in like a, at a pharmaceutical company. Uh, my dad studied computer science. Mm -hmm. I, so I come from a very STEM family. Mm -hmm. um, but I ended up studying international relations, you know, much to my parents' uh, chagrin. So yeah. here we are. Uh, can you break down what you meant by STEM family? Because this is something foreign to our culture here. This is not something a lot of our audiences mm -hmm. are familiar with. Yeah. So by STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to humanities, which are, you know, generally like English, history, non-technical fields, STEM fields are usually more computational, more quantitative. Um, so it's a specific subset, I guess, of, core, of the fields of study that obviously encompasses so many different subfields. But I came from a family, when I say STEM family, that means that a family in which my parents mm -hmm. and my grandparents had primarily studied fields that were more quantitative, fields like tech, tech and medicine. Mm -hmm. So international relations was a, a, a bit of a diversion from the path as yeah. far as they were concerned. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. So uh, something else I've been meaning to ask you is if you think there are any downsides to uh, pursuing international relations, do you think you know, there, there are any cons? You mentioned a lot of pros. So I was wondering if you think there are any drawbacks to doing this major. Yeah, there's definitely drawbacks. Absolutely. Um, one of the things, big issues, big issues is that it's a big world. It's a big world that's existed for a long time. 
And so it can be really easy to be bogged down in like a specific country, a specific region, um, or a specific time period. And in a lot of ways, a lot of people recommend that, right? They're more specialists in their field. Um, and so if you want to learn kind of international relations, quote unquote, you usually have to focus on something because it's impossible to just learn everything, learn every, all the history of every country, all the intricacies of their cultures, their languages, their economies. And so that's kind of one bigger issue. And then in general, and this might seem kind of like the opposite of what I just said, there's also a tendency in internet, international relations to study a lot of theory to study a lot of really broad generalizations of the world because it is so difficult to study everything on a case-by-case -case basis. And so when you learn international relations or you learn international law or anything in the field, you learn, you start with kind of like broad theories of international relations and then you kind of move to different perspectives. You will take different classes in different fields and kind of get a general sense of what people are saying. But it can also be, it can be, it's kind of a balancing act between thinking too big and thinking too small. And so usually you kind of have to pick one or the other and see um, basically where the card, um, let the cards fall where they may. But um, that's definitely kind of one of the drawbacks is kind of that balancing act between, mm -hmm. you know, those lenses. Do you ever feel overwhelmed studying international relations or say a history of a particular country and you're looking at the amount of reading you're you should be you should do do you ever feel uh, kind of bogged down like you said yeah absolutely all the time but for me i think and this is one of the big reasons that i think travel um and kind of international experiences are essential to learning is that when i learn about uzbekistan I don't begin with a giant thick textbook about the entire history of Uzbekistan from the Samanids or from even from before the Samanids to Genghis Khan and Amir Taymor and the Karkhanids and the Emir until the Soviets until now, right? I walk outside. <laughs> so when I want to learn about Uzbekistan, I walk outside my house. I don't, you know, it, it's easier than going on Wikipedia, I think. And it's, you know, more productive. I walk through the streets of old, so I'm fortunate enough to live in Bukhara, um, you know, obviously where there's a you know, gorgeous old city. So I walk through old city. Um, I've been to every single one of those historical sites now many, many times with and without a tour guide. I can now give my own tours um, by based off of the information that I've accumulated. So I kind of walk around and try to absorb as much as I can. Um, and even, not even just in old city, but in local restaurants, in local homes and places where people meet. So I think that's really where people something people ignore when they study world history when they study world cultures when they study you know the world is that we we take such a macro lens to it and we look at the, kind of the big globe and then they don't take enough time to meet kind of the people and the cultures and the languages that they're studying so i've had you know the immense privilege to do so here and like i said i encourage everybody to try to do that more often yeah i feel like I, I'm actually a little ashamed to say this, but I feel like you know more about the city than I do about my hometown. This is mind blowing. I'm definitely yeah. not. Definitely not. I'm still learning. Um, and that's one of the great things mm -hmm. is that, you know, I have the opportunity to learn um, constantly and as much as I can. Right, right. And so you said you've always been his interested in history, right? Mm -hmm. So say someone wants to take up international relations, but they have no interest in history. So how do you say stimulate that interest? You know, it's you know, contrary to popular belief. I think it's important, right? But you don't need to be, you don't need to know like every Chinese dynasty or know every, you know, piece of ancient history or medieval history or modern history. So I think it's important, obviously, when we talk about things like international relations to look at the problems that exist today to take a look into the past and see how we arrived there but i don't think it's always required to be no you know everything about everything so as far as your question stimulating an interest in history history is big history is long history is diverse for, for me somebody who says that they don't like history is somebody who just hasn't found what they like yet 
they haven't explored enough. So, for example, for my brother, when he was a kid, history for him started um, with basketball. He watched basketball. He loved basketball. And so before, like, he could, you know, name all 50 states in the U.S., he could tell you the last 50 MVPs, right, of the National Basketball Association in the United States. And he still, he still can. He still remembers. And now he, he, and he loves history. He reads my history books, too. And my brother's 19. Like, he's, he's also now studying international relations at school. Um, but the point being that there is so much to learn. Um, so many crazy, fascinating facts about how our histories are intertwined, how they affect our lives today, that it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's fascinating. Mark Twain says history might not repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. Like it is super, super, super interesting. I think to see the way it affects our lives today. And, you know, I encourage everybody to venture out of their comfort zones and give it a shot. Right. And uh, as someone who's been uh, studying history in great depth, do you genuinely believe that history has a lot to offer in terms of solving modern problems? Do you think we can look into the past to seek answer solutions to our problems today? You know, I think it's not always that easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not... The solution that works for us today is not the solution that worked for, you know, Genghis Khan. Um, definitely not the solutions that worked for Genghis Khan. Um, but I think we can learn lessons from the past. Absolutely. We can kind of contextualize our current moment, our current era, right? And think about where we are in relation to all the years that came before. So what the big movements of the 18, uh, 1800s were um, and the time before then, the age of imperialism and colonialism up until d sort of decolonialization, the world wars, up until kind of the neocolonial era now um, and kind of the era that we find ourselves in today. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. We can point a lot of times point fingers to kind of different historical factors which contribute to issues today we can look at policies that countries took as you know as early as you know f uh, like as late as like obviously you know 10 5 10 years ago but also we can trace back to like 40 50 60 70 100 years ago right how did what the united states did after world war ii shape the world how did the u.s cold war with russia or the soviet union sorry um change the world and affect kind of how we think today how these countries look today and there's a lot to learn so um i think maybe not a and ex obviously sometimes for we have modern problems require modern solutions but that's not to be said that we can't learn lessons um and not just learn lessons but also learn to avoid mistakes we've made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. such as you know human nature but we cannot keep repeating these mistakes so we can look for we can apply almost a scientific method to history right we can look at our statistics, at our data, at our kind of, even if it is anecdotal evidence, and see kind of what hasn't worked in the past, and then think to ourselves, if this hasn't worked the 15 times we've tried it, why do we think it would work now? So I think there's definitely lessons to be learned from history. Yeah, I, I can't agree more with your point on learning lessons from history, because uh, I remember reading actually a text about Polynesian civilization, and basically they... Uh, they their civilization collapsed and one of the theories to explain that is because they overexploited their resources and 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 then the lesson to learn from that is if we now keep using our resources to the point of depletion chances are our civilization is probably going to collapse too so that's one example i thought would bring some uh, would be like an addition to your point here yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. And so studying international relations, uh, do you do anything outside of your studies on top of, say, history? Other, subject, other subjects you're interested in, like math or computer I'm, science? I'm interested in everything. <laughs> so this was the easiest way. My major, I told you, was in two schools. I had two minors. It was the easiest way for me to group things together. Um, as far as... And, and, you know, in, in college, and so I graduated last year, but I took classes in like data science, mm -hmm. took classes in computer science. Um, you know, I took classes on CRISPR, 
So I don't know if you guys know what CRISPR is, but CRISPR is like a gene editing technology. Um, so kind of what the mechanics of CRISPR Cas9 look like um, and kind of some of the science behind that. I'm trying to think of classes I took and then language languages. So I had, you know, the immense pleasure of taking three different languages across three different lang- um, alphabets at Georgetown. Mm-hmm. Um, and still, even in Uzbekistan, I take Uzbek lessons. <laughs> and so um, I love languages. Um, and that's definitely been a unique. And how many languages do you know? <laughs> it, that's a good question. So I would say that I'm fluent. So I grew up speaking, I obviously spoke English um, and I grew up speaking Persian in my mm-hmm. household, so Farsi. And with Farsi, I think you can kind of, Dari and Tajik are definitely understandable. The both languages are mutu- mutually intelligible. And especially since I've been a Bukhara, I've picked up the Bukhara and sort of dialect of, of Tajik. So I would say I, at this point, I'm pretty comfortable with my English, my Persian, my Tajik, my Dari. And then um, I studied Spanish. So in high school, throughout college. So I took, you know, we have to take tests to get like proficiency in a language. So I took the Spanish proficiency um, so the, definitely those, I would say, are the languages I'm comfortable in. I also took Hindi in college, which was, you know, an incredibly wonderful opportunity. My last year, I had extra space and it was something that I'd always wanted to do. So unfortunately, my Hindi has gotten a lot worse because I haven't practiced. So for all you language learners, make sure to practice your language because you will forget it. But um, I still have my textbook with me here. I open it from time to time and try to write, write sentences and complete, you know, exercises over and over. And so English, Persian, Spanish, Dari and Tajik with that. And then Hindi, eh, really at the baseline introductory level and Uzbek. So now I'm learning Uzbek. So I would not say I know Uzbek, but I'm learning Uzbek and hopefully I will continue to learn Uzbek. Uh, that's seven seven languages. That that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you count them as separate, I really I, I tend to combine Persian, Dari and Tajik. But uh, it, it's you know it's it's a, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to interact with somebody in the language that they speak, that mm-hmm. they grew up speaking, um, and just to be here and learn kind of languages and to speak to, with locals in the local language is, you know, an immense privilege. And do you ever get kind of mixed up in all these different languages? Like, because when you learn all these different languages, uh, which are some of which aren't exactly common or similar, do you, it's like having a cocktail of different languages. So how does it feel? Do you ever have a hard time keeping them separate in your head? I do. I do have a hard time keep, especially because Persian, Dari, and Tajik mm-hmm. are so similar. That kind of words that exist, especially when I'm in Bukhara, mm-hmm. because some of the words that we use in Bukhara and Tajik are not Persian, or they're not usually used in traditional Tajik. They're more they're Russian or Uzbek loan words. Uh, can you give some examples? So um, off the top of your head, yeah. If you ask somebody how to say ice cream in Tajik, usually here at least they say maroshne. Mm-hmm. Maroshne. So Maroshne is a Russian word. Mm-hmm. Maroshne. In Iran, we say Bastani. In Afghanistan, they say Shir Yach. So Shir Yach makes complete sense. Shir is milk and Yach is ice. And in Tajik, that translates too. But nobody I hear, I've never said Shir Yach in my life. I don't think anybody here, and nobody in Bukhara says Shir Yach. Or if we look at like the word airplane. Mm-hmm. So airplane, I believe, Samolyot, you say here, right? Um, that is, that's, so that's a Russian word. All right. It's like an older, I believe it's an older Russian word. And that is different than kind of what, if even, even in Bukhar, the older generation still says have a payma, which is what we say in Farsi. So there's a lot of different, and there's a ton of different examples on how this manifests. Um, potato, right? We say in Farsi, we say sib zamini, right? Apple of the ground. In Tajik, I think you use the Russian, use the kartoshka. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Dari, I'm forgetting it right now, but there's another word for potato that they would think is really funny if I said it. Yeah, um, please do say it. <laughs> I don't remember it. I wish I could remember it, but I remember every time I speak to my Dari friends or I uh-huh. go to Dari translation events, they think the word Sib Zamini is funny and I can't remember. The Sib Zamini or something. I've, then the word, it, it, to prove your point, I do get them yeah, mixed up all yeah. the time, especially because there are so many similarities. Be- even in Hindi, Right. Because, you know, there's such a big Mughal influence. I um, mean, we, this is about in speaking about how history affects our current language. Right. So Babur, who, uh, Babur goes down to India and establishes the Mughal Empire, brings a ton of Persian words into Hindi and a lot of northern Indian languages. Um, and so now when you're learning Hindi, you learn kind of 
you can learn kind of which words have Sanskrit origin and which words come from the Persian Arabic tradition via Amir Tamur and Central Asians. So if you look at a map, like Persian went up and then back and, and then went down to India. So it's, you know, it, it's incredibly fascinating. It's mm-hmm. incredibly interesting for me uh, as somebody who likes history and likes languages to see how they interact. But to answer your question, once yeah. again, I get mixed up all the time. <laughs> Yeah, as someone who's been learning different languages, what are some tips and suggestions you have for people wanting to take up a new language? Like, uh, let, let's talk about English, mm-hmm. because I know a lot of people he- here they tune in to learn, improve their English skills. So, yeah, what are some tips and suggestions you have for English learners out there? Yeah, um, English is definitely not an easy language. I think it's one of those languages that you really have to interact with authentic materials. The best things that you can learn from are English, are not just, you know, are English language materials, um, English news articles, English blog posts, Instagram posts, Facebook posts, songs even. Our podcasts like this one. <laughs> Our podcast exactly like this one. We have been speaking great English here, perfect English. And so um, kind of interacting with native speakers and native materials is definitely incredibly important, number one. Number two, I would say there are no shortcuts, unfortunately. You have to practice. You have to practice. And that's one of the hard things with language because the more you keep, the more you pick up, the less you can practice. So, for example, when I'm in Uzbekistan, I'm learning Uzbek. I'm speaking Tajik with my friends in Bukhara and Uzbek whenever I can. Uh, maybe Persian with my family from home. But then I don't, for example, have any time to practice Hindi. Or if I do, it's like alongside multiple other languages that I I'm trying to like pick up at the same time. So um, definitely I would say practice as much as you can practice, 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 practice. Um, And, you know, practice not just talking to a wall, but recording yourself and playing over the recording, showing your recording maybe to somebody whose English level might be higher and asking them what are some areas in which I can improve. You would be shocked. And I think a lot of times we see that it's not just it's not like sometimes people say I'm bad at language. And for me, that's difficult because when you're learning a language, usually I think people tend to make some of the same mistakes. So if you have the same patterns that you're making the same mistake over and over again, try to see what those common mistakes are and improve on those. And it happens in every language. It's inevitable that there are going to be things that you mess up. Um, but just kind of take that sort of lens to your speaking, your reading, your writing, and your listening and say, what are the mistakes I keep making and what can I improve on? So using native materials, authentic materials, trying to practice as much as you can, and then making sure to kind of review your mistakes, review your own habits, um, and see what you can improve on. Yeah. And there's, like you said, a lot of reflection that goes into language learning. But sadly, a lot of students out there are so eager to go from one practice material to another with very little reviewing, Mm -hmm. which I find to be one of their biggest uh, problems. Yeah, for that reason, it's very, very important that you guys take the time to look back and analyze and uh, work on your mistakes as a way to improve. Now, how about teaching English? Do you have any tips and suggestions for people out there who teach English? Or you can simply talk about your own teaching approach in the classroom. So how do you go about teaching here at this pedagogical institute? Yeah. Um, so I've only, so I've, you know, had a lot of different teaching experiences, but I've only been teaching English since September. So there are far more qualified teachers than me to give big, you know, broad English advice. That being said, our English teaching advice. That being said, as far as my own experiences, um, I think there was definitely an adjustment period, a learning period when I came here. I had to learn what things I could improve on as a teacher, what issues were common in the classroom, whether it was attention, whether it was a common grammar mistake, right? Um, And I think there's a variety of different strategies that I've learned alongside with the help of kind of the Fulbright program and other teachers around me to implement. Um, I think one of the big things is a lot of teachers focus on kind of punishment and like, re- like we call it operant conditioning in English, like punishment or rewards as like the be all end all of the classroom. Yeah. It's like the carrot or the stick. Yeah, exactly. And perfect. 
Very well said. And so for me, I think it's trying to transition the class away from so much as being grade based as much as learning based, because you can pass and fail. You can pass a class and still not learn anything. And so I think trying to push students to learn, to learn, to learn, to learn, not just like pick up a trick or pick up what habit it is the teacher likes, but to really try to ingrain and learn. And so when I'm in the classroom, I'm all, I'm constantly checking to see what my student's level of understanding is. Because if my students are an understanding, then in some level that's a reflection on me. Um, obviously, I think you can, and you have to do that delicately. Like you have to do kind of what I, I use, like the thumbs up, thumbs to the side, thumbs down system. So give me on a spectrum kind of how you feel about what we just learned. I also encourage students to reach out to me individually because it can be hard to speak in a classroom. Um, I, lo I love it when my students kind of contact me and try to schedule time outside of the classroom. I know a lot of teachers don't, but for me, I'm here to teach English. If I have a motivated student that wants to learn English, I'm here to teach you. I would love to teach you English, right? And so that, I think, finding those motivated students, um, you know, always makes me happy. So sometimes individualized attention, constantly making sure, like emphasizing understanding over just grades and kind of being flexible, flexibility. I just have, I, I know there's so much to be said about flexibility for teachers, at least in my, what I've learned is that especially here, you know, I, sometimes I have 60 students in a classroom. Sometimes I don't even have a classroom. Sometimes my class gets moved or canceled when I'm on my, when I've woken up early and gotten ready for school and I'm walking and I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have about a 25 minute walk and I'm like, you know, 20 minutes into my walk and all of a sudden I get a text on Telegram that we don't have class today or this class, you don't have to come to school today. And so flexibility is definitely incredibly important as well. So kind of those three, I think, are lessons that I've taken away from my time. But like I said, I've only been teaching English since September. So there are far more qualified people, far more qualified English teachers than, than I, than me. Yeah. And I think the highlight of your speech here is flexibility. I, this is something I, that really resonates with me. And flexibility is also about the kind of textbook you teach in the classroom. Because sometimes when you see something is not working, mm -hmm. you should be willing to take a break from the usual curriculum and try something different and not be afraid to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And because I see sometimes teachers think that if they... Uh, deviate from what they are expected to teach in the classroom, they may not get the desired outcome. Mm -hmm. But it's okay, because if, if this, there are different kinds of students with different levels and they have different capabilities and there are different kinds of learners, so you should not be afraid to, uh, to try different materials and sources, and there's abundance of them out there. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of and, times I think teachers have like five objectives, mm -hmm. And they want to hit all of their objectives, hit all of the topics. Um, and students will get maybe a partial understanding of all five, but they won't really learn all five. And they won't really learn any of them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think it's more important to make sure if my students learn all three and for the rest of their lives, if they can remember those three objectives that I taught them, those three subjects or those three topics, I would be happy. I'd be happier. So instead of just spending kind of doing like a partial amount of effort mm -hmm. on each one. I don't want to move on until I know that we have learned. And so obviously that's part of my privilege as a te as an ETA to be able to say that and as not somebody who, you know, runs the whole curriculum. Um, but I think it is, it is at least something that I appreciated when I was a student and something that I think has been essential for me as a teacher. And how do you get that confirmation from a student? that that they've truly understood grasp some, something or is it based on only thumbs up and thumbs down or do you have anything <laughs> any other ways of evaluating that yeah thumbs up thumbs down usually to clarify is for like quick things in which we have a lot of like many things that we need to work on and so if i explain answer a student's question mm -hmm. um and the rest of the class doesn't get it i want to know so that i can hit on it mm -hmm. as far as getting confirmation from a student and you know any te a lot of teachers will tell you this they have to say it in their own words if I explain something to you and 10 seconds later, you cannot say the same, you cannot explain it in your own words, then you haven't learned it. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes students will memorize exactly what I say because, you know, students are smart and they, we kind of all learn and interpret and soak things in differently. And so sometimes students will memorize what I say and they will repeat my words back to me. And I, if I tell them, if I ask them to explain it or change one word, they won't be able to. And so asking students to explain it in their own words is so important, not just for confirmation, but and then it helps them learn as well. And oftentimes, if it's something one student's having trouble with, then it's something other students are having trouble with as well. So explaining in their own words is definitely really essential um, and kind of engaging different class people in the classroom, not just the one or two students who always have their hand up, who always know the answer, but those who for whom it might be a little bit more difficult. So I think that's really essential. So what's your next move here once when you get a negative confirmation from a student so that they don't really understand it, fully grasp it? Do you simply repeat the same concept or try explaining it in different words? I try going a different angle. So I, I try to give as many, when I teach, I try to give as many examples as I can, especially if I'm teaching grammar or vocabulary. I like to both give my own sentences and then when I'm asking for confirmation, ask my students to give their own sentences back to me. So if I teach you a word and you can use it in a sentence, then I, was, I feel a lot more confident about you having learned that word. Um, so definitely, when, so definitely I think kind of giving examples and tackling it from a different path. Like I said, a part of that also comes with flexibility. So instead of just kind of trying the same thing over and over again, if something isn't working, if some explanation or concept is hard to get, then taking a different path. How can I relate it to their lives? How can how is this something that manifests? How is this a word that they could use in a sentence with their friends, right? Um, not just a word that they could find in you know a textbook somewhere or in you know, crime and punishment or something. Right? How could they use this word in their lives? And so basically, I think like I like to answer your question. It's just a different angle, different approach. Asking them kind of what they don't understand also, you have to be able to say, like, you have to be able to ask them kind of what they're not understanding. Because sometimes for us, it can be frustrating when we know a concept and we know it really well, why our student isn't grasping something. But for something like language, where we, you know, we grow up our entire lives speaking our native, our home languages, right? Um, it can be difficult for a student. I completely understand that and I empathize um, and I'm here to help. Yeah, yeah. And I really believe, I'm, I'm also a big believer in getting students to, giving students more relatable examples. Yeah. This is something I find myself do a lot in the classroom. So say I'm teaching the word agitated, mm -hmm. I make up a sentence that they can relate to. For example, our teachers right now agitated that we're having a hard time learning this word yeah. agitated so they can kind of see that frustration on my face so they can see oh yeah so this is what agitation frustration looks mm -hmm. like yeah that yeah. that helps that makes a big difference yeah absolutely yeah all right now uh, more on education uh, since you've been working here for some time now what do you think are some of the strengths and weaknesses of our education system here local education so do you have any uh, comments to make as an objective Observer. Mm -hmm. kind so, of strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Oh, or or just let's just strength. Let's focus on strength. You no. Know, or, or, or like Miss Kathleen once said, you can say strength and differences. That's okay. that's the way she put it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I like that better because once again, I haven't been here long enough to. Who uh -huh. am I? You know, as a re, as a newly minted English teacher. Or 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 you can say things. things I would have done differently. Okay, I think some of the strengths are. Um, there are a lot of ambitious students. There are students who are, and I constantly have students who are asking me for um, programs, for opportunities, for legs up. We have a lot of ambitious students. The ambitions, the goals are up there. Um, you also have a lot of students who are willing to work and part of it i think it's just a cultural thing or um kind of coming from a collectivist versus an individual culture but i find students work really well in teamwork and when i put them in teamwork they don't get um they don't get super distracted they work well in teams 
Um, they kind of are creative with the ideas that they come up with. Um, where I would say some of the differences or some of the things that I personally have struggled with are scheduling can be very difficult. Scheduling classes, kind of some of the logistics, um, you know, I'm some like things that are changed last second, rooms that get moved, classes that get canceled, classes that get combined. Um, that is something that was difficult for me, like I said, um, and something that I imagine is difficult for students as well. And in general, the entire educational system, right? The teachers don't benefit, the administrators don't benefit, the students don't benefit from everything being last second. Um, but then going back to strength, it's a credit to the students and teachers that they're able to work in these conditions and they are so flexible and like for, they don't even bat an eye. So whatever that is another, you know, strength of the system is that whatever comes their way, they kind of take it in stride and they adapt. So you have a lot of adaptable teachers, a lot of adaptable students who are very highly ambitious. Logistically, I think there's, there's some challenges for everybody involved. And then sometimes as with any, as is the students in everywhere in the world, this is by definitely not just, you know, here is that kind of the extra motivation. So you have the ambition, right? But if I have a speaking club and you have told me how much you want to learn English and how you want to go and study another language then come you have to come to my speaking club. I know that it's outside. You don't have like, I know that it's outside of class hours, but it's, you know, if you're motivated, you kind of, you gotta, you have to be a self starter. You have to be somebody that pushes yourself um, to kind of ed educate yourself and who pushes yourself to do better and be better. Um, and that's not easy. That's not easy. And this is definitely not, Excuse me, this is definitely not something that is exclusive to Uzbekistan by any means, but it's an issue, I think, with students all over the world. It's just like if we have high ambitions and people care about kind of that end result, but are not always willing to do the work in between. So I think teachers, you know, everywhere are struggling with this. And I'm sure as a teacher, you relate. Oh, yeah, I can totally relate to that. A lot of the students I see, they talk to talk, but they don't walk to walk. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big issue. So what do you think can be done about the situation? So how do you, how do you give, how do we give students that little bit of push? I think it starts, and this is something that for me, it, you know, it helped me when I think back. So I took, I mentioned I took Spanish. M many st students in the U.S. take Spanish. Right now, Google Translate. Um, and ChatGPT and, you know, all these tools that we've had Google Translate for a while, ChatGPT is a newer one, but um, a lot of people use these tools to kind of weasel their way through their classes to get good grades without doing the work. Um, and I remember, you know, when I was a kid or when I was learning Spanish or when I was in other classes, our teachers used to make a sign a contract at the beginning of the class. Um, saying like, oh, like if I used got caught doing Google Translate, like I accept these will be my consequences and my punishments, whatever. Um, but I remember I had one Spanish teacher when I was a junior in high school. I had her for the first time. She sat us down and she said, you are not going to like, I'm not going to have you do that. I am. We're going to, a little bit of his trust. But she had an honest conversation with us where she sent us some articles about how language learning and how real language acquisition helps our brains. And she said, when you use Google Translate, you're not cheating me, right? You're not pulling a wool, the wool over my eyes. I already, I can tell, right? It's really easy to tell. But you're cheating yourself, right? You're denying yourself the opportunity to learn, to be better, that is no, like you are, and that I think has always resonated with me. The idea that you're cheating yourself. And so when you're a student who's at a university, right, your time, you're, you're only going to be here for four years. You're only going to have access to your education for so long, right? Um, and that's if you're not paying tuition for it. If you're paying some sort of tuition or some sort of fee, right, you are quite literally paying per hour, per minute, per second. And by doing using tools like Google Translate um, to cheat and work your way around assignments, you're only cheating yourself. You're letting that money go down the drain. You're letting the time and the effort and the investment that your parents have put in you, your family has put in you, that you put in yourself go to waste. And so for some reason, Senora Dada, if you're listening to this in the United States, um, you know, I, that was, I was in the 11th grade and I remember that class. I remember the article, articles 
And I just, I, it's always stuck with me, the idea that you're cheating yourself. And that's, I, it's definitely, it's a problem in the United States. I was I'm almost a little bit surprised to see it's a problem here. Um, kind of the pre- prevalence of sort of cheating and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so impressive. It's so mind blowing how a simple, honest conversation can make a paradigm shift in a mm-hmm. student's thinking. Mm-hmm. It's it's so powerful. So your suggestion is we teachers should be having more of these honest conversations right. than simply taking the path of uh, carrot stick or carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So we, I think, talked a lot about education. Now, what do you say we move on to some um, other topics okay. like culture? Uh, mm-hmm. We'd like to know more about life in the U.S. So you come from Georgetown, right? So I went to Georgetown University. Mm-hmm. Um, my hometown is Somerset, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So what's life is like there? Culture, food? Um, I'm a little bit biased, but I will say <laughs> New Jersey has some of the best food in the world. It is the most underrated state in the United States. Don't let anybody tell you differently. New Jersey mm-hmm. is great. Um, I love New Jersey. To, to answer so, I, I'll start talking about America in a bit. But I love New Jersey. I love my hometown. I love the fact that at least where I'm from in Central Jersey, it's very diverse. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to you know constantly attend middle school and high school and elementary school um, with people from a variety of different backgrounds. And that's something that has, you know, always stuck with me and something that I didn't realize how much of a privilege it was until I went to places um, and settings in the United States that were not that diverse. And all of a sudden I was the only brown one in the room or the only one with, who could grow a beard. Um, and so <laughs> this was not that wasn't something I experienced until later in my life than most Americans do. And that's kind of because I had such a you know, I was so privileged to to grow up in an area that was diverse as Central Jersey. Um, they also have some of the best pizza and some of the best bagels in the world. So I'll put that, I'll move New Jersey to the side for now. As far as living in the United States, I think it's difficult to kind of narrow, give it just one, one adjective because it's so big. It's so big. Um, but I will say that there are a lot of people in the United States and I've made a lot of friends who are diverse, who are from, like, who come from diverse backgrounds, um, who want to really like leave the world better than it was when they came into it, who want to make the world a better place. Um, people who are just really, really, really kind, really, really loving, um, who value there. I think there's, you know, a lot of stereotypes about the United States that, a lot of people are very competitive. It's dog eat dog, you know, um, wake up, work, go to sleep. And that's definitely it's, it's case. There's a lot of people like that. And work culture in the United States can definitely be a little bit toxic. But there, it's a huge country. There's, you know, 330 million people, I think. Um, and there I've met, you know, I'm incredibly thankful for my friends that I've met here, uh, met there and here actually. But um, I'm incredibly, incredibly thankful for the people I met. Um, as far as culture, it's once again, it's our culture is in theory acceptance, right? Our culture is the melting pot, the salad bowl, um, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the idea being that there are people that you will find people in the United States from each and every part of the world. Um, and I think that's something incredibly valuable. I think to some degree, it's something that's incredibly unique to the United States. Um, and so it's the culture. And the food is delicious. The food is very good. There's a lot of jokes about America not having a national food. I don't know how true that is. I would say every region or state has its own food. But I would my, my, my hot take, my controversial opinion, is that the United States has some of the best versions of other countries' foods. So, like, obviously, like, best Uzbek food in the world is in Uzbekistan. But I, I would say maybe like the second or third or fourth best Uzbek food in the world is in the United <laughs> States. And so, or like Persian food, for example, best Persian food is in Iran, obviously. But the second best Persian food is in the United States, um, in my opinion. So a lot of good international food as well. Well, well that's, that's actually something I can confirm from personal experience because when I was in the U.S. and living on this island called Outer Banks, I was exposed to uh, s- such a 
big cultural tapestry of you know different kinds of food and people with different perspectives and different traditions and customs. I I, I used to uh, live next door to uh, Hispanic people who had their parties on the weekends and barbecues. And they, people, their friends would come over and chat, and, and and there were Italians too, and they were sometimes loud. But anyway, so yeah, yeah, it's it can be incredibly, uh, incredibly enriching and very exciting experience living in the U.S. So, and something else I, I was meaning to ask you is, so how does it feel growing up in such a culturally diverse area environment? So, d- did you have a say trouble? blending in with your friends and culture there, like being exposed to all these different, you know, people with different mindsets and different perspectives. Does it ever feel, uh, say, it, because it's like you're thrown into this uh, wind whirl of different mm-hmm. cultures. So, and, and, and I can only imagine how hard, how hard it is for someone very young to navigate their way uh, through this storm. Yeah, it's not always easy. It's not always easy. Um, you know, I remember kind of one of my earliest experiences is when I was a kid. So in a lot of languages, we don't have the TH sound, the th, the th. So like three, like through, et cetera. And so when I, we didn't have in Farsi, we don't have a th sound. And so when I was, I grew up speaking Farsi in my household. And then when mm-hmm. I went to school, the th sound, the TH was very difficult for me as it is also for a lot of my students here. Um, and I remember like, I, I was just teasing, but I do remember getting teased about it and then going home and making sure I could pronounce my thuz, my, so I would pronounce tree and three the same way. Um, or like, you know, through, I would pronounce true. Um, so just like, I remember practicing that and trying to make sure I got the handle of that. Um, which was a little bit difficult for me at the time when I was young. But as far as, you know, on a whole, as a whole, it, it, it is an immense privilege. And once again, not everywhere in the United States is like this. Um, you know, I can speak to my own experiences where I grew up in Central New Jersey, but it is an immense privilege. And it was always an incredibly immense privilege to grow up surrounded by so many cultures. So, for example, in New Jersey, we have a, or in Central New Jersey in particular, we have a large South Asian community. So South Asian, um, like, like Indian, Bengali, Nepali, Sri Lankan, Pakistani, et cetera, right? Um, like that South Asia, like that region uh, of the world. And so when I was in high school, like a lot of my, all, really it's like most of my best friends were South Asian. And, you know, it was ne- as somebody who was not South Asian, it was never an issue. It was, it was just, you know, an, a, a privilege, it was, I, I loved it. I love that, you know, I got to celebrate Diwali with them um, and dance with them. Um, and like kind of, I emceed our Diwali shows in high school. And I, you know, ate, I went to their houses and kind of, they helped me build up my spice tolerance because I- Iranian food is not spicy whatsoever. Um, but Indian food is obviously. And then when I went to college, um, a lot of South Asian people, a lot of my South Asian friends in college were like, why in the world do you know these things? Why have you had these foods and, um, you know, tried, you know, gone, done these dances? And I was like, because I cut my state. This is my community. My best friends were, um, you know, this was like my best friends were South Asian. It was a privilege to kind of learn about the culture from them. Um, I was also then there were Iranians near me. And so I think not everywhere in the United States I could I'm not sure I'd be able to say that everywhere in the U.S. that I had access to a community of local Iranian Americans. Privilege. It's it's really. And I know I've said this multiple times, but it was a privilege to grow up somewhere that diverse. Yeah, and I think it's the your diverse upbringing that puts you in a very unique position to get into international relations mm-hmm. because you've developed all the cultural tolerance, like your understanding of all these different cultures, and you've experienced. Uh, different things have had a taste of a little bit of everything. So that puts you, I, th- I feel like in a very unique position to mm-hmm. uh, take on the, some of the world's big problems because now you have the, you can see all these different cultures and their differences and kind of the, uh, make decisions that would, that would be inclusive, that would take into account all these differences and intric- intricacies of different cultures. Yeah. Um, I think you just, you learn the value of incorporating 
local voices, like you said, um, including diverse perspectives. Um, and that's something that's, I think, lacking in a lot of spaces um, and a lot of, you know, powerful rooms is kind of the absence of the people who are being affected or the people um, who have different backgrounds. So they have different ways of thinking about things. Yeah. Yeah. And it, let's circle back to education. Mm -hmm. I know you have some experience in teaching SAT and ACT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what do you say we talk about that a little as well? And sure. hope you don't feel like I'm taking you on a roller coaster of different topics here. Yeah, no worries. education and culture and now back to education. Yeah, yeah because I want to make sure that I get through all these questions before we end this podcast. So. Yeah, no worries. And feel free to, you know, give me a sign or something. Mm -hmm. if my answers are too long. Uh -huh. uh, no, no, no like there, are, there are very subtle. Something. <laughs> there are very they, somebody can give me a sign. Yeah. But, there, um, yeah, I, I did. So I, I don't want to, you know, I, mm -hmm. I only did it for a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't super long because, you know, we take, I took the ACT in what would have been September, October of my junior year mm -hmm. of high school. So October 2017, I took it. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a really good score um, or a score that I was really happy with and that put me in a position to kind of, um, you know, help others. Um, with kind of their ACT, SAT prep. I think it was an incredible, it was an interesting experience, I would say. It was definitely interesting because I've taught different things. Um, you know, I used to teach chess. I've taught language. I've taught, I mean, it was a TA for Persian. I'm a TA for English. I do history, whatever. Standardized testing, I think, is a different beast. It's a completely different animal as far as what you're teaching. Um, sometimes you have to teach to the test a little bit kind of prepare students for the type of questions they're going to encounter, the type of rubrics and grading decisions um, that the testers will have in front of them. Um, and it's, 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 not, it's not the same, I think, as teaching a lot of other you know, topics. So uh, do you have any tips and suggestions for students who want to pick up SAT, who are doing their SATs at the moment? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's you have to take practice tests. Mm -hmm. You have to take, so I can talk about what worked for me at least, is that I started off with a score that I was happy with, but that I was not in love with. So I only took the test once, but when practice tests, I was scoring kind of, okay. Like I was, you know, I was solid, I was good, but it wasn't where I wanted to be. And it wasn't where I thought that I was capable of. And so what I started doing is taking practice tests. And I remember my exact schedule, um, you know, my exact breakfast and tea that I would have right before I took my test. And I'd wake up, especially on it was Saturdays were my test days, wake up, take it, simulate the exact same testing conditions. Nobody talked to me. Nobody called my, like, no phone. Phone's in the other room. I have this amount of time for this section, this amount of time for this section, whatever, five-minute break, then five-minute break, and then, boom, like, this is the essay. And then I would grade myself according to, you know, the answer key. And then I would go back and review what was I making? What was I doing well? What was I doing poorly when I was taking it? So when I was, I was studying myself, I think what helped, what really took me to the next level is when I started using the actual ACT tests. So I was finding the actual ACTs, the former tests that they'd given um, and using those because before I was using different prep books um, and my score wasn't as indicative as what it was on the final test. So I was using prep books and I was getting like a 30... They, like the ACT is like out of 33 or the ACT is out of 36, sorry. And so I was using test prep books and getting like a 32 or a 33. Um, and then when I started taking the actual test, my scores kind of went up a little bit up. So I was 34s, 35s, 36s. Um, and so I was fortunate enough that when I ended up taking the test, I got a 36. And I think that practice tests that were former tests were more reflective of my personal ability. So when I was teaching students, I was giving them those former tests that the real official standardized tests that they used um, for the ACT and the SAT and saying, take these, use these, right? Take the test, exact same test conditions, and then look at your mistakes. You have to check your mistakes. Um, if, you don't, if you don't, then you're kind of taking it for the sake of taking it, right? That last step is incredibly crucial. Take the practice test, check your mistakes, and see what you can do do better, right? From there, you can develop strategies. 
So for me, the English section of the, um, or the reading section of the ACT was the hardest. So there's an English section, a math section, a reading section, and a science section. So English is being like the difference between the two being English is more like grammar um, and like sentence structure and reading is more reading comprehension. And the reading comprehension was the hardest for me, even as a native speaker of English. Um, and so I kind of hammered down on those sections and there's not really much you can do, right? Talk to my friends, ask them what strategies worked for them and kind of develop some strategies that I thought were working for me as far as getting through the questions, getting through the passages on time having time to go back and check process of elimination, how I got rid of answers. And so that's what I always tell my students in this order, take the tests, take the actual tests, check your mistakes and develop strategies, um, you know, for effective, you know, improvement. And a cool question. You did it all by yourself or did you have any mentor or someone guiding you during this process? I did all by myself. Mm -hmm. I did all by myself. Um, there was a woman um, who like helped with like essays. And so I had like a one hour meeting with her once where I asked her like, how are some ways that I can improve my ACT writing? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, she gave me some tips uh, uh, between the two of us. I don't know if my ACT writing, like my essay improved that much as a result of her advice, but that was it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think for the majority of students doing the, their ACT or SAT for that matter, mm -hmm. self-studying is not really a good option. Would you say that? You ha it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to discipline. It comes mm -hmm. down to discipline. You have to be able to be self-disciplined, get yourself to do stick to a rigid schedule without distractions. Um, and a lot of students can't do that. Um, a lot of students benefit. Um, so a lot of students benefit greatly from tutoring centers from tutors from you know companies to help them improve but even those companies will tell you that at the end of the day it's up to you to do the work to improve yourself to some degree right even those tutoring companies can only do so much because you can only force the student to learn so much they have to be willing to do this do the work themselves and so at the end of the day it comes down to self-discipline i just um my family didn't feel that it was like the right financial decision to pursue like a much big and their very test prep is very very expensive in the united states um and so we kind of went a different went in a different direction and it worked out for me um so i'm incredibly fortunate um but i know that for a lot of people for whom kind of those tutors and agency centers have helped immensely gotten their scores up you know mm -hmm. many many percentiles and to what do you ascribe your self-disciplined quality so where, where does that come from? Or say I'm not a very disciplined guy. How do, how do I cultivate that quality? It's, it's a good question. Um, and honestly, self-discipline is something that, you know, since then it's something that I've also struggled with as well. It's not always on and off. Like sometimes it's like comes and goes in waves. Um, as far as kind of cultivating that sort of self-discipline, for me at least, you know, my, my parents always tell me that, like, I'm an investment, um, not just in, like, a monetary sense, but that they put in their time and their love and their compassion um, and, obviously, their money into making sure that, you know, I am the best version of myself that I can be. Um, and for me, that is incredibly important. So some people are very competitive. I think in the United States, they're very dog-eat-dog, -dog, um, very, like, they would, you know, step on one another, each other's like, throats to get a leg up. For me, I think the person that I'm most competitive with is myself. Um, so, like, if I think that I am, if I do something and I say that really this was my best piece of work, even if it's, like, objectively not a great result, if I personally can look at it and say this is, I have reached the maximum of what I feel that I'm capable of, then I'll be satisfied. But I was getting lower scores and I was looking at my mistakes and I was saying, I'm better than this. I can do better than this. Um, and I haven't, you know, I haven't thought about this in a while because it was like six, seven years ago. But I just felt at the time that I'm capable of more than what the score indicates. And so um, the same thing I think is true for everybody, right? You know your own limits. It's not about competing, excuse me, competing with others to be better than your neighbor or your brother or your friend. But it's about competing with yourself i think honestly pushing your boundaries of what you are capable of and had you always been like that or was there any say a push or influence in your life that uh, kind of turned you like that my parents definitely pushed me quite a bit 
I would say that um, kind of middle school, like really, really young age, I was a little bit, I think, lazier. And then finally, I, I reached the point where I was look like I was saying, where I was looking at what I personally thought I was capable of. And I was looking at like kind of what my grades were. And I was like, I don't think these two things are matching up. So then it started, I started pushing myself harder so that I could reach my own expectations. Um, so that's really, and I think a lot of people live by other people's expectations, live by your own expectations, but make sure you, those are high, right? Like push yourself. Um, because only, you know, what you're capable of. Um, definitely my parents, I would say, are a big influence in helping me do that. Um, and kind of honestly in the middle of high school from middle school was kind of the first initial push. And then in the middle of high school, I think between my sophomore and my junior year, something just kind of clicked when I was studying for this test. And I was like, this is my future is in my hands right now. And I have the ability to be, um, you know, ordinary or I have the ability to be, you know, to live up to how I, mm -hmm. how, what I think I'm capable of. So I see that self-discipline was sort of prompted by self-awareness yeah. that came with older age. <laughs> yeah, def definitely. Yeah. It was something that grew over time. Although, like I said, it's even something I continue to struggle with. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's quite a fascinating story. Yeah. And I got some more questions about SAT I'd love to ask. So, uh, you see, we launched our SAT division here at the school quite recently and we're kind of new to this. So we honestly have not much idea what we're doing here. So uh, do you think, do you think three, four months time, time, time period is enough for a student to go from 1200 to 1500 plus if they're, if they're studying every day of the week for two, three hours? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think it is. Um, you know, not everybody will always be able to, you know, there's only as teachers, I think there's only so much we're able to do. And a lot of it falls on the student. But I would never say that that's something that's impossible. Mm -hmm. I would, if you have a student that is capable, a student that is intelligent, a student is hardworking, you know, the sky's the limit, right? You, these scores, um, can they, they can, and they're not always rigid, stagnant. People think that they, it's like a, I don't know, you take it once and it's like a personality test or something. You're stuck with it for life. You can improve. Um, and even a three to four months, you know, 1200 to 1500 is definitely a big leap. But if you're a student who's studying two to three hours every day, like you said, I think it's possible. Just falls upon the student. You know, those have to be good studying hours, you know, because it's not an easy, that's not an easy jump. Right. Yeah. That fully answers my question. And, one other question I was meaning to ask you is, like in a lot of the U.S. universities, do they have language requirement? And if so, is it TOEFL or IELTS? For foreign students? Mm -hmm. To answer your question, I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. I am not the right student to ask about that, or right person to ask about that. I do know that IELTS is a British test and TOEFL is an American test. Um, so I would imagine that TOEFL would be more popular among U.S. universities, but also I've learned here that IL seems to be pretty internationally accepted as well. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I'm not the right person to answer that question. I would imagine TOEFL in for U.S. universities is more important. Right. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we can finally close the education chapter and I got... A few more questions. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you about your major, international relations. Yeah, sure. So this is the uh, this is the part of the podcast where we might uh, we, we're gonna venture into some uncharted territory and talk about current political situation around the world. Mm -hmm. So this rising global tension uh, in the in the in in, in the West. So w as a as a as an objective observer well, where, where do you think that comes from what do you think are some of the underlying causes of the current political situation in the west so what what contributes to this rising global tension between say the uh, the, the russia and the u.s yeah you know it's difficult for mm -hmm. me to say first of all it's difficult for me to describe myself as an objective observer <laughs> you know because i'm inherently all subjective um 
As far as rising tensions between the U.S. and Russia, I wouldn't say this is something new. I would say that as far as the world is concerned, right, kind of the since kind of 1945, um, the World War II ends, the Allied powers defeat the Axis, we kind of start espousing the idea of this sort of international liberal order, right? The idea that it's no longer going to be one country that dominates others in theory, but values, right? Kind of those values of liberalism, of self-representation, of democracy, of, you know, equality and justice and all values that I obviously are incredibly important for any government. Um, and, you know, you know, uh, that I agree with wholeheartedly. But I think what we're now seeing is, is the West kind of they set up a lot of these Western countries, set up this idea, this international liberal order, and they fail to live by their own mottos, by their own credos. And so and some to some degree, we're kind of seeing how a lot of countries are now looking at what's happening in Palestine, for example, um, and kind of the U.S. role and the U.S. complicity in that genocide. And they are kind of then a little bit more the next time the U.S. comes and starts talking about democracy and human rights, they're a little bit more skeptical. Right. When so when these Western countries are so quick to allow and to help genocide happen, how can we expect other countries to look at us as sort of these moral kind of exemplars? Um, and the answer is we can't. And so I think that's really kind of one thing the international um, kind of international relations scholars are kind of reckoning with at, at right now is kind of how are these international liberal values that we've talked about for so long how are they manifesting and how are we representing? Um, are, are we kind of living by our credos, our mottos? And I, I would be hesitant to say that that's something that's happening across the board. Tons of different examples that we can look at kind of the ways in which, you know, um, you know, Western countries have failed to live by those ideas over and over and over and over again since 1945, since obviously before 1945. Um, but... You know, I think that's definitely kind of one of the reasons is uh, obviously I think, um, you know, not to get too much into U.S. politics, but I think the Trump presidency hurt you know, U.S. credibility on like an international stage um, pretty factually. And that's the thing. I think Western powers are starting to lose a lot of their credibility because they're failing to live by their the values that they keep emphasizing about right. the values that they've emphasized. Right. So you, like we said, like that's the theme of today's podcast. You mm. have to be able to walk the walk, right? You can talk the talk. <laughs> you have to walk the walk. Um, so my hope as a U.S. citizen is that we can kind of correct the course um, and walk the walk. Um, but I need to see it to believe it, you know? Right. And that was actually my next question. I was going to ask you where you see our world headed. Like, do you see light at the end of, end of the tunnel here? You know, um, so and who's gonna pull us out of this mess? Oh, if that, that's <laughs> you know the trillion dollar question. Um, it's difficult for me because I kind of feel like I might be saying something controversial here, but I feel like Mr. Trump is the only savior. <laughs> or you think he's gonna hurt I'm, us? I'm gonna go on record <laughs> saying I disagree with that. 100 percent disagree going on record with that. And like we said, um, you know, I can look back to kind of history. Um, mm -hmm. and see why I don't think that's the case. Or I can turn on my phone right now and go on his you know, social media and tell you why that's not the case. So that's one of those things that we have historical and modern evidence of. Uh, I think it's not going to be a single person. It's not going to be a single person that pulls. It's not going to be a single country that pulls us out. When, you know, in the international relations, we talk about hegemonic power, Right. The idea that there is one country that is so powerful it almost like rules the world and it has like a world dominance. Uh, and we talk about poles. So the world has a North Pole and a South Pole. We talk about polarity in international relations. A lot of people think after World War II, we kind of established this like um, two, there were like two poles, like a bipolar system the United States and the Soviet Union. You had these kind of big powers like fighting this Cold War, more or less chewing away at one another. Then post after the fall of 1991, a lot of people talk about the idea of like a unipolar, unipolar world, right? So the kind of the move towards kind of the United States kind of emerges victorious, quote unquote. Um, capitalism as one, their values of one. Um, look and see as for the model of 
what the world should be like. Then we get, you know, we get the genocides um, of the of the 1990s. We get um, the wars and the forever wars um, in the Middle East and the wars the United States declared um, throughout the 21st century. Uh, and kind of we kind of start to see that idea, that credibility chip away. So I think the key is kind of moving more towards a concert of voices. So I away from the idea of like a unipolar or bipolar, but a multipolarity and not just polarity. But I think the, I, I don't I kind of almost reject that system and more like a concert of voices. Right. We need people who are affected by some of the world, by some of the world's policies and the West's policies at the table. So when we're talking about climate decisions, climate policy, right, you look at the countries that have the most emissions and then you look at the countries that um, the often de developed countries who have the most um, emissions per capita. Um, and then you look at the countries that are being hurt the most, right, the island countries, the countries who are subject to ecological disasters. Um, they're smaller, but their voices need to be incorporated. They need to be at the decision-making table when we're making climate decisions, for example, because it can't just be the West saying we're going to continue to do this, this, and this and pollute the world. Um, so I think that's kind of important. We need to, like I said, we need to walk the walk. We need to move more towards a concert of voices that incorporates voices from the global South um, and perspectives from all over the world. Um, as far as the light at the end of the tunnel, it's really difficult. Um, for me to, to make that make that call, make that decision. My hope is at the end of the day, I mean, I studied, you know, uh, my hope is that we can move towards a place in which human rights are respected, um, you know, and recognized universally, right? Because a human right is something that we have by essence of us being human, not by being from one country or one social class. Um, but I don't know. Uh, we're going to have to make some big steps and fix some big things. Yeah, for sure. The world needs more people like you in charge. So <laughs> this thing comes to an end. All right. Based off on this conversation, a lot of people can tell that you are great at communication. You're a great, uh, very well-spoken, eloquent speaker. So I'd love to hear from you some uh, suggestions on how to improve public speaking skills. Because this is something I noticed from the moment I met you, you are amazing at speaking so uh, what are a few things you would recommend to people who are trying to improve or trying to level up their communication skills that's really kind of you to say that thank <laughs> you um uh, be because the complexity of your arguments is just so mind-blowing to be able to think in this uh, at this level you have to have so much mental clarity and sustained focus like i, I can i don't ever see myself being able to gather my thoughts and speak this long on a particular subject at in at this depth in this depth with so many different arguments and examples it's just way way above my head <laughs> No, no, you sure. speak incredibly eloquently and I, you know, I have the, once again, the luxury of speaking in my first language, you're mm -hmm. speaking in your fourth. So, yeah. um, without, you know, flawlessly, my, I add, I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate the compliment, but right back at you. Um, in terms of improving public speaking. Mm -hmm. So the stereotype advice, stereotypical advice is imagining the audience in their underwear, um, I think that that's what we say. So I don't know if that that, that phrase has made its way to Uzbekistan yet, but we say imagine everybody you're speaking to is wearing underwear yeah. uh, because it's a little bit less threatening, I think, um, or is only wearing underwear, I should say. Um, so I think that, but the idea being that you kind of have to get comfortable, right? You have to, you know, embrace it. Like feel comfortable in your you own skin. You have to skin. feel comfortable in your own skin, exactly. You kind of have to, and so, for some people, there's just different strategies, you know, um, practice, 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 practice. If you're giving a speech practice, um, you know, uh, sometimes like one thing that I struggle with a lot is I look above somebody's head or to the side or something like that. And I definitely have my fair share of attention issues, but I think trying my best to make eye contact and if I can focus on making eye contact and then, you know, speaking, the rest of it comes, um, I, I hope that, you know, my ideas make sense and the things that I'm saying make sense. Uh, oh, oh yeah, they, just, do. You know, they do. They make a lot of sense uh, to me. Yeah, empty words. But mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of as far as presentation, at least, you know, trying your best to make eye contact, mm -hmm. getting comfortable in your own skin and mm -hmm. practicing. Right? It's not something 
Some people are, I just naturally a little bit mm -hmm. comes to them a little bit easier. I was not one of those people. I kind of had to practice and you can do it too. You can, anybody can do it. You can just look in the mirror, mm -hmm. practice looking at your own eyes and speaking. You know, but sometimes even with hours of practice, it's something that's so hard to come by because I find myself some, sometimes fumbling, looking for words, and, and I have this mental fog. So I was wanting to ask you if there is anything you do in the way of maintenance, like maintaining that level of focus and clarity. Like, how do you, or is it something that you, you, you are lucky to have innately? Uh, I definitely would not say focus is something uh -huh. I'm lucky to have innately. It's mm -hmm. something that I struggle with. Um, you know, you guys can't see, but I'm like tapping my feet underneath the table. I'm like always like jittery. Uh -huh. um, so as far as focus and getting distracted, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, easily distracted. I think some strategies that I have been trying to use at least is to kind of um, different strategies regarding like my phone time, like putting away my phone at night and in the mornings um getting good sleep eating well um kind of meditating i used to always have trouble falling asleep kind of just taking a bit of time before i sleep every night to kind of clear my mind to think and reflect um and kind of just exist in the moment that was something i kind of discovered later in life or um and something that i'm very thankful for um and if you don't know how there's a ton of guided meditations on youtube well they'll walk you through how to focus your breathing how to focus your thoughts um, and so those are also valuable and worth checking out. It's not going to be the same for everyone, but at least those are some strategies that have worked for me. And I definitely could not say, I definitely, you know, continue to struggle with focus and things like that. So I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It's all we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, something I personally do to make sure I have this mental clarity and focus throughout the day is I try to avoid a bite-sized content on youtube or tiktok because i know on those days when i'm watching too many videos back to back and they're all short it, and it's not something meaningful it's all dumb silly content those are the days i have trouble putting my thoughts together mm -hmm. in words putting my thoughts mm -hmm. in words yeah, yeah. so the obviously uh, stay away from social media if mm -hmm. you don't want to find yourself uh, stumble through your words and and, and put yourself in an awkward position when you're on stage and something else I do is like reading mm -hmm. or watching to podcast is mm -hmm. surely an antidote to short attention span. So if you're someone who has trouble focusing or uh, simply constructing a complex thought, you should simply start listening to more uh, long form content yeah. like podcasts or at least, you know, pick up a book and read 10 pages a day. This is something I totally recommend to people out there trying to pull their thoughts together. Definitely. I love reading. I've always mm -hmm. loved reading. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thankful I found a bookstore mm -hmm. here with English books. So I'm reading. So here. what kinds of books do you like to read? What do you read? I read everything. Um, I read everything recently. Um, I, so I've, you know, in my house right now, I have a crazy weird collection of books. So I just finished beautiful world. Where are you by Sally Rooney? She's an Irish author. Or more, I've read, her, I've read her other two books, Conversation with Friends and um, Normal People. Um, I liked Conversation with Friends the best. I think maybe Beautiful World, Where Are You the Worst or the Least. Um, but so that one is like more like realistic fiction. Like, so there's nothing crazy about it. Um, but I also read like fi fantasy, science fiction. Um, I just read um, Never Let Me Go by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro. I'm reading, I have Clara and the Sun on my uh, book on my bedside table mm -hmm. ready to start mm -hmm. um i also so i have my friend who was visiting she left me a copy of the alchemist and so i read the alchemist like a while ago but um i think i had a feeling it might feel different being in you know a completely new place i don't know if you guys have read the alchemist um, but being in a completely new place and reading it so um i'm excited to read that read some fantasy books this year historical fiction history like nonfiction, mm -hmm. and anything i can really get my hands on so of all the books you've read in the past, what are your top three favorites? Top three. Okay. What Bab are your favorites? Babel by mm -hmm. Rebecca Kwong mm -hmm. is really, really good. Um, Babel's, Babel by Rebecca Kwong it came out last year. It's like a fantasy book. Excellent, excellent, excellent book. Um, 
There is an Iranian Canadian sociologist. Her name is Neda Maghbule. She writes, she has a book called Iranian Americans and the Limits of Whiteness, or the Limits of Whiteness, like the Everyday Lives of Iranian Americans. This is not a book that would apply to everybody, but it talks about kind of the history of what it means to be white for Iranians, Iranians who self-identify as white, who say they're not. And for Uzbeks, this might seem like a dumb conversation, but in the United States, it's something that affects our lives really tangibly because they used to have quotas for how you could immigrate. So they would say, we, we can only have this amount of people from this country and this amount of people from this country. Um, and so how you defined yourself affected that quota, like what quota, what group you were considered. And, you know, growing up as an Iranian American in the United States, we have to fill out surveys um, every time we take a test. Sorry, I've gone on a tangent now, but every time we take a test, we have to fill out like a like a survey that like in which we are we apply to a job that says like, oh, look, I'm white, Asian, Latino, African or, or black, et cetera. Um, and so that is some and those those almost never reflect kind of people from the Middle East. And especially people from Iran are a little bit unique within that. Um, and I won't get into the intricacies, but like there's never a Middle East category. So Iranians and people from the Middle East and also people from Central Asia are told to fill out white. Uh, Central Asia, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Some Central Asians fill out white, some fill out Asian. But if you look at me, right, I'm not treated the same. Like in a lot of places in the United States, I'm not treated the same as a white person, right? A lot of institutions, a lot of states and cities and towns right and so when we fill out when we don't have that sense when we don't have that data that representation we can't point to say these are how middle eastern people from the middle east are functioning or pe people from middle east and north africa are functioning in our society or are we don't have those statistics we don't have information we don't have issues on racial bias or information on racial bias it can affect um kind of that treatment and kind of keep perpetuating that sort of treatment so sorry for the tangent but um, The Limits of Whiteness by Nida Maghbule really kind of talks about that conundrum. And she's a sociologist who gives a lot of how that manifests in different ways. Fantastic, fantastic book I really loved. Um, um, third one, Between the World and Me by Tani Easy Coates. Um, I read it for my freshman um, pro seminar. Um, and it's a letter that like a father writes to his son uh, about what it means to be like also like black in America. And that was a, a, a really powerful read. It was one of the first, uh, and it's one of those pieces of reading that's really stuck with me. So Babel by Rebecca Kwan, Kwan The Limits of Whiteness, and um, Between the World and Me are probably my top three. Would you like to write your own book one day? And if so, <laughs> what would it be about? What would it be about? What would I mean, you what would you write about? In theory, I would like <laughs> to, um, but I obviously I don't know if I'm capable. Um, if because you've traveled to so many different countries and talked to different people and seen so many different things and you majored in so many different subjects, so you you've amassed all this knowledge and experience. I'm sure a lot of people would want to know about. I'm sure a lot of people would it could could benefit from. I, I appreciate that. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody would benefit from my experience uh -huh. um so much but i would i would love to write a book i aspire to one day know enough about something where i would be able to write a book but i don't know if there's any topic that i know enough about yet like any single topic to write a book about yet uh, but hopefully one day um if i am feel so passionate about something and i feel like i have something to offer to the scholarship um and to the writing that exists or if you know i have inspiration for a fiction book um, and I feel like there's a good story to be told, but mm -hmm. as, of, as of right now, I nor have been, I do not, I'm not sure I have either the requisite knowledge or kind of the inspiration for a fictional book. Yeah. Uh, I, I got an idea for you. Here's an idea. How about your, you said you would love to write a fiction book, possibly write a fiction sure, book yeah. one day, right? Uh, how about adventures of yeah. Anima? around the world yeah we'll, you could talk <laughs> we'll see we'll see i think uh, like a memoir sort of yeah that would be we'll see if i once again i have to you know mm -hmm. live a life worth mm -hmm. writing about and if you're going to going on tours and trips to all these different countries you might as well start vlogging this is something you should seriously consider i don't know yeah 
I've always been more of like, a, I, I, people have told me, and I have a really good friend from the United States who blogs, um, and she's, you know, wonderful and incredibly successful at it. Um, for me, I'm very big. Like I, I like to, you know, go outside and sit on a bench and look in the like, gaze mm-hmm. around me. And I very much like to soak in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know, I, I haven't tried vlogging as much, but I'm not sure if I would be able to appreciate the same. It, it's a no brainer to me. It's a no brainer. Cause if I were in your position right now, I just pull out my phone, just start talking mm-hmm. and show different places to people on my phone. And it, there's not re- really much to vlogging other than just pulling out your phone and recording a video. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I'll take it under sure. advisement. If, yeah. Sure. And more on personal interests and hobbies, do you like watching podcasts or listening to podcasts? If so, what, what kind of stuff do you listen to? Um, I listen to a lot of news podcasts, mm-hmm. especially. Um, yeah. So NPR has some good ones. Mm-hmm. Foreign Affairs. Um, just New York, The Economist. It's a good podcast. Mm-hmm. So I listen to a lot of those. Um, those are kind of really the main, as far as podcast consumption, sometimes if there's like a specific like person being interviewed who I like to hear, um, I listen to them. I love chess. So as far as hobbies go, chess is, I would probably say, my number one hobby. And so I have, I've listened to chess podcasts, which might seem like the most boring thing about the most boring thing to some people. <laughs> but uh, I like chess. And so I've listened to, I listened to a chess podcast this morning um, that was about like the upcoming candidates tournament in Toronto. So I like, so kind of mostly nonfiction podcasts, a lot of news, lots and lots of news, kind of foreign affairs types of things. And then also chess and some occasional kind of history, science, et cetera. I'm sort of surprised here that you didn't mention Joe Rogan because <laughs> none of the guests I had on the podcast from the U.S. mentioned Joe Rogan on their list he, uh, he didn't even make it to the list and oddly enough he's one of the number one top podcasters in the world the, the best podcaster in the world yeah. i i would say that maybe a majority of joe rogan's audience mm-hmm. does not leave the united states very often uh-huh. so maybe they have not just they just haven't made their way to uzbekistan yet mm-hmm. because he tends to uh, in my opinion at least from what i've gleaned um he tends to have a very i think standard audience I know we talked a little bit about like fighting and like, uh, combat sports and things like that. And especially since coming here, I've tried to pick up more and watch more combat sports. But uh, Joe Rogan podcast is not my thing or I, I don't watch. Oh, why not? Don't listen to. Um, I don't is that because he's such a controversial figure? He's definitely controversial. I would say that kind of uh, to be honest, I've never I've never sat down and listened to a full episode. And so. I, I've said I've you know had a lot of mixed reactions to the clips I've seen, um, the ways he's reacted to people he's, he's had on, and the type of people he's had on, um, and kind of some of the conversations that are had. In general, I don't listen to a lot of interview podcasts like that. So um, you, more, usually it's like oh I, I, I also I listen to like sports podcasts, I listen to like nonfiction podcasts and chess, but like a little bit less so for like entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, more for like learning i guess and what's one podcast you'd love to see in the future love to see uh-huh like a po- like a current podcast that exists that i would love to listen to uh no so uh, a guest you'd like to see on on a podcast oh a guest that i would like yeah, to see yeah a future on, guest a guest that i would like to see on a podcast um it's a good question good good question Someone you you would want to hear from, someone you would want to know more about, someone you're curious about. Um, let me. Th- I, I'll have to think. I about mean, it. I'm personally, I'd love. I'm. I'd love to see Donald Trump on Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> he, w- I'm sure he would go on. <laughs> yeah, um, and Joe Rogan is the type. But or, or 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 Vladimir Putin on Lex Friedman podcast mm-hmm. because uh, Lex Friedman knows a bit of a little bit of Russian. Does he? Uh, I think he does. Yeah, he I'm not sure if he know. can speak it, but yeah. he's uh, Russian descent. Yeah, you can say like Mojna Adin, mm. like Mojna Dva, like Katoshka. <laughs> yeah, okay, good for, good for him, I guess. Uh, I, yeah, um, yeah. I, I I've never listened to anything by or um, Lex Friedman either. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just podcast as a medium in general. I only watch like a very specific subset. I see the Joe Rogan clips on my like social media on occasion, 
I don't really, it's just not my thing personally. I see. I get it. Totally get it. Uh, can we talk a little about your sport gym life? Yeah, because during our meetup, you did make the point that you hit the gym mm -hmm. you, very frequently, but I'm not. Let's, like, let's, let's, I, w I wouldn't say very frequently, as you can see, maybe not very frequently, but I'm trying to get better at it. Uh -huh. It's a work in progress. I'm a very new gym goer. Um, you know, I came, well, I've had a lot of free time here. Mm hmm. Um, and it's something that I want to work on kind of, like we said, I, I, part of it is just like, what do I personally feel like I am capable of? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, going to the gym uh, is part of that. Do you work out alone or you got some gym buddies? Um, usually alone. Oh, usually, yeah. I've made some friends that are usually there when they're there at the same times, uh -huh. but usually alone. I mean, I just put in my, um, I put in my earbuds, mm -hmm. um, and kind of block out the rest of the world and I give like however 90 minutes and then mm -hmm. so it's like a choice you prefer to work out alone you don't want to be bothered when you're working yeah. out and i think that's one of the things i like about here is that like i it's i feel less self-conscious mm -hmm. i just kind of do my thing and come and leave and you know you see some familiar faces but nothing too nothing too bad i don't know if i'm a good enough gym goer yet to mm -hmm. kind of start working in groups but hopefully hopefully i can get some of my numbers up some of my reach some of my fitness goals right Right. And you, you said you're also into sports. Mm -hmm. What do you say we talk a little about UFC? Let's talk about UFC. Yeah. So I love sports in general. I watch a lot of basketball. Mm -hmm. I watch a lot of football, tennis, and soccer. UFC is a newer addition, but I am up to date. Um, so, yeah, more or less. But let's talk about UFC. So uh, what's the latest match you watched and how did you like it? What's the most recent match you watched? What are the most recent? Yeah. So I like... Mm -hmm. um sean o'malley sugar sean um watched his match against vera mm -hmm. um and before that you know aljermaine sterling so what, what do you like about sean 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 malley I, I like his i don't know i like his essence i like his you know style his style he's his, a little bit yeah he's, he's young he's mm -hmm. fresh i think mm -hmm. he's, he's really clinical i think with his footwork his kicks he got unlucky his first match against Vera, um, and he kind of proved that this time. Mm -hmm. um, but I like, I like the way he kicks. I like the way he, his his timing. I think is really precise. And I'm really I'm one of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I can appreciate some of those bigger heavyweights um, and what they're capable of. But for me, at least the ones that are a little bit more entertaining are some of the slimmer guys, the quicker mm -hmm. ones. Izzy is another one of my um, favorite fighters. Um, so but like he, watching, he, he lost his he last lost, three yeah, matches. Yeah three matches he lost against yeah he lost against strickland and then he lost against um what's the guy's name Pereira. alex Pereira. yeah alex Pereira. but then he made a comeback yeah yeah he knocked him out mm -hmm. i don't remember it was the first round or the second round and uh, his post fight interview in the octagon was it's yeah. something out of this world yeah. Yeah, he's, he's like, a good trash talker too. He's a good, he's showboats too. He does. Yeah. He, he's oh, yeah. the last style bender. You know, yeah. that was really cool. I don't know when I was like learning about it. I think he gets a lot of his inspiration from anime. Yeah, he watches yeah. anime. He does a lot of anime and style. Uh -huh. The last style bender comes from the Last Airbender, which I uh -huh. love. It's a TV show. It's mm -hmm. a cartoon animated TV show. Um, so I like those guys. I know you said you're a big John Jones fan. Oh right? yeah, uh, yeah. Bones. His, his nickname yeah, is Bones. Bones. Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Straight out of New, Me New Mexico, I think mm -hmm. is where he practices. Um, yeah. Um, Bones Jones. Uh as far as let me think. Who else? Yeah. I like Nganu. I know he's mm -hmm. he's boxing, I don't think he's working out quite so well for him. No, he he lost to Joshua. Yeah, he lost to Joshua. Joshua has a punch. He he has one of those plays crazy. That it's it's he has an arm on him. I can't they say he's a cannon on him. Oh my God! But yeah, he lost to Joshua, lost to Fury. But that was mm -hmm. that one. Fury is a different style. He's more stamina. Uh, what's what's one UFC match you'd be willing to pay a million dollars to watch? A million dollars. I want to see Jones and Ngannou. I want, I would see Jones and Ngannou It'd be a heavyweight mm -hmm. match, my like longest reigning champion at the moment. I, I I would see it. And why 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 is this fight? Is it because two of the greatest. Yeah, it's the big guns. I think the style will be interesting. And Ganu too was a hard, 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 one of the hardest punches. Jones, I think, is a little mm -hmm. bit is is well rounded. 
you know, he's a little bit better on the mat, I think. Um, like his jujitsu and things, mm-hmm. but less obviously. Uh, but Nganu packs a hell of a punch. It'll be a good story. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be good for the sport. A lot of people will watch. Um, I know Khabib's taken up coaching since his father passed, but you know Khabib wants to come back. Khabib, Khabib McGregor too. Oh, did you hear that Conor McGregor is going to be back? Yeah, I heard McGregor's coming back. Yeah, in June yeah. or July. I don't know. Yeah. He's going to be fighting Chandler, Michael Chandler. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if he's in shape. If he's still got yeah. it. Um, but yeah, I did. I did see the McGregor's coming back. And McGregor, yeah. um, you know, could be a never get up matchup. Would be crazy too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why? Why do you think UFC is super successful, widely successful, and everyone loves UFC? There are a bunch of other same organizations like MMA, and uh, there, there, there are some Russian fighting organizations. But for some reason, they don't get as much publicity and attention as UFC does. So yeah, I mean. Part of it, I think, is marketing. Mm-hmm. Part how you market yourself to the world. I think some of our foreign fighters have been huge for the sport, right? So obviously, um, you know, we're sitting in Uzbekistan talking about it. Actually, there's an Uzbek fighter who fought last night. I didn't watch, but he won um, his match. I'm gonna, I can pull that up for mm-hmm. you after. Um, but obviously, in this part of the world, UFC is huge. I wouldn't. It's interesting. Not everywhere in the U.S. I would say it's huge. Um, and even in the U.S., like, like I didn't watch it as much until I came here and people were talking about it. And I was like, OK, like I want this is for me, this is part of the culture. Like mm-hmm. I want to be able to talk about the things you guys want to talk about. Um, so I, it's part of it's well marketed. It's well also I think, like sports leagues are businesses. Right. Um, and they should be evaluated on how they function as a business in those business decisions. Um, and the UFC is, you know, well marketed, I think. Um, they're reaching a broad audience, international fighters. It feels a lot more international than like boxing, mm-hmm. for example. Um, and that's something that a lot of sports in the U.S. are struggling with right now is how do we expand internationally? Um, baseball has found kind of its niche in East Asia and a lot of other places in, in the DR and in places in Latin America. The NBA, also in East Asia um, and in Europe, across Europe. Um, and obviously the NBA Academy in Africa, a lot of people coming from there. Football, you you know, like you American football, still trying to find its niche. I think um, they more and more international games every year. Um, MLS, not MLS strategy. The MLS brand, international strategy is always just bringing bringing the biggest name we can think of. They brought in Beckham back in the day, and now they have Messi who plays on an MLS team. So yeah, they're all trying to you know. Um, because you have to expand, you have to expand. It's like the base, the tenant of business. If you want to, you know, they want to deliver shareholder value, they're going to have to expand, embrace international audiences. That'll be how they succeed. And the UFC has done it well. Um, Makhachev and Normagedov and all these guys, GMF, have been really good for them. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. To, I'm interested to see kind of how the sport's going to evolve. At the same time, I feel like UFC has a new competition. They are not the only game in town anymore. And I'm talking about here influencer boxers like Jake Paul, right? How do you feel about the upcoming match between Jake Paul and Mike Tyson? I'm really conflicted. Yeah, I'm really conflicted. So Jake Paul, you're right. Mm-hmm. Those those ma- those boxing. So we we talked a little bit about UFC boxing as a sport. Those numbers are going down. You know, it peaked with um, McGregor Mayweather, and since then, you know, it's been on a downward spiral. Um, but it's really just, it's influencer boxing is making, making the rounds and getting a lot of viewership. And Jake Paul has crazy numbers. He sells out stadiums and arenas to come watch him. And so does his brother. Um, I think it would be bad. If Mike Tyson loses, mm-hmm. it's bad. It's one of those things that I almost feels like a lose, lose for, in, in my mind, if I'm on Jake Paul's theme, either he beats Mike Tyson and nobody in the world thinks that Jake Paul is like a better boxer than a prime Mike Tyson. So either he beats Mike Tyson and the narrative becomes he beat up an old man, which yeah. is the only reason he would win, the only way he would win. If Mike Tyson is physically not capable of winning, which I think is possible, or he loses to Mike Tyson and the narrative is he got beat up by an old man. So either you beat up an old man or you get beat up by an old man. And neither of them is really a win-win um, as to like proving how you can do in the sport. Um, he needs to he needs to fight real boxers. He fought Tommy Fury. He fought Tyson Fury's little brother. He lost. Um, KSI. He lost. KSI is another British YouTuber. He lost. Um, he's fought 
old men um, and MMA fighters. And he's one good for him. And I have no doubt that Jake Paul is a better boxer than the average person. The question is, you wanted to establish yourself as a boxer, box boxers, right? <laughs> Fight boxers. At, at the end of the day, like prove, prove, you got to prove it. Um, but honestly, for these guys, a lot, especially a lot of the guys that come in, it's big money. It's big money. And who are you betting on? Mike Tyson or Jake Paul? I forget who it was, but Mike Tyson had a fight against, or like an exhibition mm -hmm. against, like, like I think it was Roy Jones Jr. Or five something. years ago. Yeah, yeah I Roy remember Jones that Jr. one. And he didn't look, <clears throat> and that's, that was, once again, Mike Tyson is what, like 60 now? Yeah. Like 61, I think. And he's going to turn on 60 by the, by the time yeah. the fight is on. Yeah. He didn't really, like against Roy Jones Jr., he's not, mm -hmm. he's not Mike Tyson anymore, you know? So I think youth prevails. Reach. I honestly, honestly, if I had mm -hmm. to bet money, I think Jake Paul would win. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I kind of pray to God that he doesn't. I think it's bad for the sport. And you think the guy's on steroids? Jake Paul? Yeah. It's hard to say, though. It's hard to say. It's hard yeah. to say. Uh, steroids are a big problem, I think, in the sport. They're all over the place. Um, you know, all combat sports, all sports in general, honestly. But especially in combat sports, it's a big issue because you can kill someone. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Honestly, I don't know enough. I haven't followed his journey close enough. I know he invests a lot into kind of his team, his diet. He has people that kind of make sure, like, everything. They kind of tabulate everything. But, um, like, his eating, his exercises, his he has, mm -hmm. like, meditation and yoga. I watch, like, the Jake Paul documentary on Netflix. Um, <laughs> Sound yeah, like a big fan of the Jack Paul, Jake Paul. I, I'm yeah, not a big fan. I'm a curious observer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like to know as much as I can about things people are talking about. Yeah. And for whatever reason, people, a lot of people are talking about Jake Paul. So mm -hmm. I'm curious. Well, if I had to put my money on it, mm -hmm. put it on Jake Paul. But I hope he doesn't win. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's going to be a lot of fun for our viewers like us to yeah. watch that fine. That, that, yeah. That's why it's popular. It makes yeah. boxing fun. Like people are going to watch. Yeah. People want to. Mike Tyson isn't like the most famous boxer alive, arguably, you know arguably but probably mm -hmm. right especially for like older generations jake paul younger generations like my generation grew up watching jake paul from the time they're like 11 or like 12 on like social media like vine and the, what, what, like the equivalent of tiktok back then mm -hmm. um and then they've seen him become a youtuber like you know i've seen jake paul like jake paul is like a, if like a little bit older than me i've seen him through like every stage of life and it has never been I've never wanted to. <laughs> it has always been against my own will. I have had to learn about what Jake Paul is and what he's doing. So, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yep, very interesting. All right, uh, we're about to wrap up this podcast, but before we do that, I have a few more questions I'd like to ask you. Now, this is a part of the podcast we get a little philosophical and okay. um, do some deep thinking, right? So the question I want to ask you now is, is about your personal philosophy. So what is your philosophy in life? I know we had a very sudden sh yeah. change I of topic. I have to reset a little yeah, bit. Yeah, like you said, let yeah. me my personal That's, philosophy. Yeah. We're shifting gears so fast here. Yeah. Um, I think I owe a lot of my kind of personal philosophies to my family and my upbringing. So for context, I, I'm not, I don't live, I don't have a huge family. Mm -hmm. That's my mom, my dad. I have a brother who's 19. And then I grew up most of my life with my, my grandmother lived very near us. My, um, she was my dad's mother and she was, you know, just an amazing woman. She was really my inspiration. And she, her, so my dad is one of four boys. My grandmother's husband, so my grandfather passed away when my dad was a kid. My grandmother only had like a sixth grade education um, and she raised whole family by herself um, in Iran, sent them all around the world. So two are now in the U.S., one's in Germany, one's in Austria. Um, and then she like came herself with my dad um, to live in the States. And so she, I think until the day she passed away, um, was always just like, she, she's probably just one of the most selfless people I know, like or I knew. Right. Until, and I was one of the last, I was, cause and she passed away during COVID. Um, and we weren't allowed to see her in the hospital and things like that. But you know, I was, I was one of the ones who took her to the hospital. And one of the last things she did, she said to me, is like, if I've done anything wrong in my life, like, forgive me, like, may I be forgiven. 
And I think that idea of selflessness, that idea, and she was just so happy all the time. And she lived to be like pretty old age, 88, like upper 80s, 86, I believe, 87. Um, and I think like just that sort of philosophy, be good and do good, you know, um, leave the world a little bit better than you found it and leave the people that you meet, you know, better than you found them. Like it's happier and more content. I don't know. Leave a good impression on them. Uh, if I can, you know, do it, do that, even like a fraction of a percentage of, you know, the way my grandmother did, then I will have be, I will be content with my life. Um, that is, we talk about reaching goals for ourselves. My goal is that, you know, I don't, you know, I don't need, I don't need to, you know, be, I don't want to be a president or something like that. If, but if I can be a good, if I can be a fraction of a person that she was, then that's a victory for me. I'd be happy. You know what? The, the world needs more people like you. <laughs> the world needs more people who genuinely wants to want to do good, who genuinely want to contribute. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, who, are, who are ready to set aside their personal ego and just give themselves to the world and contribute and serve to the best of their abilities. Yeah. And what's one piece of advice you'd give your 15 year old self, 16 year old self, if you could go back in time, had a time machine. So what's something you'd, say to your younger self because i know a lot of, there are a lot of 15 16 year olds right now watching this podcast so what's something what's one message you have for them i think have faith have faith that things will work themselves out you know work hard be good do good but have faith um because there have been a lot of stumbling blocks in the journey um but i think I'm incredibly happy where I am right now, sitting here speaking to you in Bukhara, um, you know, very far away from where I grew up and was born. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't encountered each of the stumbling blocks. And at 15, I was definitely encountering stumbling blocks. Um, and so I was doing it again at 16 and 17 and 18. And, you know, I continue to encounter stumbling blocks and I forget that sometimes. But, you know, things have a way of working themselves out. I think I'm you know, different people have different ideas, are religious or have different beliefs. Um, whatever you believe, um, you know, fate, I think, is important. Like, things work themselves out. Yeah. Have fate and trust. That's very deep. All right. I don't really know, know what to say. It was one of the most insightful podcasts mm -hmm. I've ever had. Sorry I'm if gonna, I talk too much. No, 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 no. Everything you said, because I'm just sitting here learning all this. And it's so much information, so much education, and I wish more people out there can watch this and learn from it. Because I, I know for a fact I'm going to go back and watch this podcast a few times because I, I, I'm going to be completely honest. There was times I was not paying full, att full attention. I need to go back and reflect on those moments because there's so much to learn from this podcast, this conversation. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and sharing with us all this uh, useful tips, advice, experiences. Yeah, it means so much to us. It means a lot. Yeah, um, of course, it was my pleasure. Um, and, you know, you have my contact if you ever want to reach mm -hmm. out um, or if there's anything I can ever do to help. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for having me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, sure. And we're going to attach all your links in the description box so if people want to reach out and know more okay. about you. Cool. So, yeah, we can do that. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, before we wrap this up, do you have any final comments or re remarks you, you want to make? None that come to mind. Thank you so much for having me once again. All right. It's been a pleasure. Great. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, episode. And if you liked our content, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and give us uh, a like and leave your comments in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.